in getting ready to introduce part five of the God Deeds mindset, it, it's going to go all over the place to make a point, and so I want to introduce it with this little segment. What is your favorite cup? Coffee, tea, whatever hot beverage you like to drink. Mine was a stoneware mug with somebody's crudely drawn picture of a cactus with a cactus flower. And somewhere in the firing, or I don't know what went wrong, but the, the cup had a huge crack in it. It was a tawny beige. You know, almost a, I don't know, a brownish, tiki color. The stoneware. It was glazed and it had a rim that was glazed with dark brown and then the cactus picture was on the side with this huge crack going from top to the bottom of the cup. Now I used that cup gotta be for 15 years. And that crack in the cup never leaked the coffee I drank in it. Nor did the coffee ever stain the interior of the mug. Now it wasn't pretty it was rounded at the bottom, you know. But I love that mug. I must have had 24, 25 of them. But I love that one above all the rest of them. Why? I don't know. It wasn't prettier. Just did. Now your favorite mug or cup might look different. So think about that. What's your favorite mug? Think about what it looks like. Think about what it means to you. Now we're going to switch this up a little bit. What's your favorite plant? I have a lot of plants I like. I can't stand flowers. I don't know why. I just don't. I guess my favorite plant would be a croton which I used in my Nat videos. My The Croton that I bought at, came, at Walmart had a bunch of Nat eggs in it and I had still, I mean this was like four years ago, there were, all, there were thousands of Nats that birthed out of those Croton. And, and I actually, you know, had fun with them. Made some of them into pets and some of their kids are still alive today. You know, every once in a while I'll see one. But the croton were yellow and green and red. And I just liked the way the leaves were shaped and everything about them. What's your favorite plant? I bet you could go into some description like I just did about the cup and about the plant, right? Think about your favorite plant for a minute. Now, ask yourself this question. Is the cup superior to the plant? Or is the plant superior to the cup? Now, if you're not capable of thinking outside the box, you're going to think those are the only two choices. One or the other. But if you think outside the box, you're going to say, hey, wait a minute. They're very different objects and you can't talk about superior and inferior right the cup is good for one thing the plant is good for something else I like the cup because of X Y and Z I like the plant because of N B and C fair enough now ask yourself this question is either the cup or the plant superior to you? 
or are you superior to both of them? If you answer honestly, and you'll do it with some discomfort, technically you're superior to both of them. You're alive, their implements, their property of yours, or could be. Right? The same would be true if you're, say, 20 something years old compared to a five year old. Generally speaking, the 20 year old is superior to the five year old. Whether it's 20 versus five in terms of mental development, or it's 20 versus five in chronological age. Oh boy. So a whole bunch of things out there, which I use every day whole bunch of people out there I know every day and I just didn't think about them as being inferior I just thought of them being them the cup is a cup I don't sit there and say to myself oh you're a cup I'm superior to you oh that would be silly I don't look at the croton and say, well, I'm superior to you. You're just a Carlton. But, unfortunately, I might look at the five-year-old, especially if I'm feeling bad or annoyed, and say, well, you're only five years old. Whoops. So who's really inferior? The one who makes an issue of being inferior or superior? Or the one who's just looking at the thing for what it is and enjoying it for what it is? At the person for who he is and enjoying him for who he is, good, bad, or indifferent? I mean, it's not by mistake that most of the movies we watch stress the bad guy. You ever notice that? I mean, you got a whole lot of people talking about Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's good. Mm hmm. Aren't a whole lot of movies made about him, are there? But there are a whole lot of movies made about the devil. The guy who in the mail room does his job day after day after day sorting the mail, delivering it to everybody in the office. You don't see much of a hero movie made about that person. But you see a whole lot made about the guy who robs a bank is a criminal, especially if he goes straight, or especially if he gets it in the end. The bad guy always gets the movie. The bad guy's always more interesting for an actor to play. Well, but the bad guy's inferior, right? I mean, we have to say he's inferior. The good guy's superior to the bad guy. We all say that. Mm, okay. But the bad guy's getting all the attention. The inferior's getting all the attention. So, are you busy looking at that bad guy on television or in a movie? And while you're watching the movie, you're busy saying, Oh, he's a bad guy. I'm superior to him. No, actually, you're probably all wiped into the plot. And you're trying to guess what's going to happen next and trying to figure out what you're seeing in the screen. You're involved, therefore, in the intrinsics. 
the intrinsic of a cup is that it's a cup. And you're glad it's a cup. You even have a favorite cup. You're involved in the intrinsics of a plant. And you're glad it's a plant. And you even probably have a favorite plant. And if, you know, plants aren't your thing, pick something that is. A favorite aircraft. A favorite gun. A favorite sports ball. You got some things that are things that aren't really necessary for living or maybe are that you just really like using over and over and over again or seeing on a frequent basis. But they're always things. Every day you deal with the newspaper boy or the grocery clerk or the cashier and you have to call that an inferior job. But at the same time, I bet there's been somebody in your life who's been a cashier or a grocery boy or a newspaper boy or a clerk who you really liked. And it didn't matter at all to you that that person had a so-called inferior job. And you have to call it an inferior job. It is much easier to be a cashier than it is to be President of the United States. And what am I getting at here? This diversity, this inequality, is what makes life enjoyable. Inequality. I am not equal to you. You are not equal to me. The whole issue of equality is, is really, it should be a justice issue. In other words, my being a higher person in society than you or vice versa doesn't warrant the law treating one of us better. You commit the crime or you don't. You're guilty or you're not. The facts are what they are. And your own personal status in society should not influence the justice in your case. If you killed somebody, you should die. It shouldn't matter if you're rich or poor, or well-known or not, or respected or not. Did you kill the person? Is there a death penalty for that? Bye-bye. Extenuating circumstances are no. They can't be based on your influence in the community. See the point? That's equality before the law of justice. But that's not an equality of person. Nor would we want it to be. There's nothing in this life that's equal. And it doesn't work well when it is equal. You got a bunch of guys on a playing field and they're roughly equal to each other. They duke it out. When there's an acknowledged inferiority or superiority amongst the group of people, they tend to find their slots and work together. Unless they're hallucinating about what those superiorities and inferiorities are. You know, you got a family. There's dad and mom and two or three kids. And one kid can do certain things better than another kid versus another kid can do other things better. So the kids all kind of look at each other and see what they do better and worse and they all kind of, you know, help each other out. And then everybody helps mom and dad learn the computer. And mom and dad, of course, rule the roost. The family's not equal. Now, why am I going through all this? Because equality is overrated. We don't live that way. We don't die that way. It wouldn't be enjoyable that way. The more equal you are to somebody else, the more there is a need to compete. And that's fine in sports and business. 
It's got a place. That's extremely important that we have an equal footing in the law for justice purposes so that justice doesn't, you know, favor a particular societal standing, poor or rich. But it's not fine for daily affairs because there ain't nothing that's equal, nor would you want it to be. I do not want my cup to be a plant. Do you? If all cups were plants, then there'd be no cups. If all plants were cups, then there'd be no plants. This is precisely the point that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 12 when he's talking about what? The body of Christ. Each one of us has different slots on the team. Some parts of the body are more seen than others. Some parts of the body are more glamorized than others. But God made every single part. So no, we're not equal. But we're all necessary. Now, the reason that matters so much, and of course in the immediate context of 1 Corinthians 12, the biggest reason it matters is the proverbial brother hand and brother foot. And, you know, Paul's talking about spiritual gifts in that chapter. Oh, I'm a hand and you're only a foot. I'm a hand, but you're an unpresentable part. Yeah, and the unpresentable parts are the ones that do the reproducing. That's the point Paul's making because he's always focused on pregnancy and begetting. He's just like obsessed with it in all of his letters. Yeah. Okay. I'm only brother foot. The Christian life is supposed to be doing good deeds because we're only feet. Yeah. Uh -huh. The whole body is just one foot. See the point? Satan would love it if we all regarded ourselves as single parts of a body rather than looking at the whole doctrine about the body. And he would like it even better still if he could cut off the head, who is Christ, which is exactly what he does in translation of the entire 1 Corinthians letter. So if you're into the Greek, I would bid you look at 1 Corinthians 1, five and 1 Corinthians 12.31, which introduces the head, the topic of 1 Corinthians 13, the head, Christ. Because love is his head. Love is the nickname for his head. And his head is the theme of the whole letter, starting with his words in your words, which is mistranslated, in 1 Corinthians 1 5. And then Paul is like, how do you want to call it? Leapfrogging. He's got little bullet points that he's using to jump from place to place in his letter. So it's not too hard to understand if you understand 1 Corinthians 1 5. 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the thinking of Christ. Okay, the thinking of Christ, which is the head, the 1 Corinthians 12.31, surpassing the body. Yeah, the head is above the body. So the head, the thinking, the word of the Lord, his thinking, is 1 Corinthians 13 being completed. And even your average Calvinist pastor knows that 1 Corinthians 13 is not about the human emotion of love, but is about the word being completed, canon being completed. That's what Paul's talking about. But he's using wordplay. Now, once you understand that, and you go back to the analogy that Paul is using the body. Not every verse in Scripture, and we all know Scripture is holy, not every verse in Scripture is equally important. They fit together. 
But not every verse in Scripture is equally important. Psalm 138, too, is far more important than Isaiah 14, 12. Isaiah 14, 12 is about Satan's fall. Psalm 138, too, is about God subordinating himself to the truth. David laying flat on the threshing floor of Onan, knowing that that one day is going to be the Holy of Holies, for the temple that's going to be built after David's death. God puts the truth above his own name, and Satan puts himself above the Most High. Which verse do you think is more important? Obviously, 100, Psalm 138 too. So now, if even in the Bible, which we know is entirely the Word of God, there are parts of it which are less important than other parts, but it all fits together, then God Himself, in Himself, of Himself, does not have a problem with some things being superior and other things being inferior. In fact, obviously what he wants is the fit. Now, do you see any Bible verse that's inferior to some other Bible verse Standing up and crying, like the believers in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm only a foot. I'm no good. I'm just a foot verse. I mean, in 1 Corinthians 12, there is a foot verse. Does the foot verse stand up in a crowd and bemoan the fact, well, my verse is only about feet. Does the hand verse stand up in a crowd and say I get to be a hand verse ha ha I'm better than the foot verse which is a couple verses down no you do not see the verses contending with each other about the fact that yes one is inferior to the other it's okay with the verses that they are inferior it's okay with God is he belittling the foot verse no, it's in the Bible. Is he belittling the hand verse even though it's superior? No, it's in the Bible. So what? where's all this belittling coming from? I'm just a foot and you're a hand. Oh, I'm a hand and you're just a foot. Oh, I'm a human being and you're only a cop. Oh, I'm a croton and you're a cop. Ha ha! Where's the belittling coming from? It's coming from the human. It's not coming from the Bible. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from the croton. And it's not coming from the mug with the cactus on it. So what's the problem that the human has? Why are we so obsessed? that anybody can get on television and say if you don't have secret deodorant you can't get the boys if you don't have this mustang you can't get the girls if you wear Nike basketball shoes you can play basketball like Michael Jordan that's what we buy into just like the woman bought into the fruit in the garden we are so obsessed with our inferiority that, that people can make a lot of money selling us stuff that makes us feel better about ourselves. So what's wrong with being inferior? Huh? Did God make you? Yeah. So then it's okay with him. What does it matter if it's not okay with somebody else? But that's precisely the problem that the next segment is going to deal with. 
using as his jumping off point 1 Corinthians 13. When you get the head of Christ in your head, then his superiority is front and center to you. You're totally in love with him. Your own inferiority is, in, is front and center to you. And you're constantly aware of your inadequacy. How do you deal with that? The answer comes up in the next increment.